This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. And straight ahead on the program, a look at the U.S. housing market ahead of the big spring home buying season and some highly anticipated data on inflation and economic growth. I'm Tom Busby in New York. I'm Stephen Carroll in London, where we're looking ahead to AI's starring role at this year's Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. And I'm Brian Curtis in Hong Kong. I'll take a look at Baidu's upcoming results and whether AI makes an impact. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, the business news you need to wrap up your week. Available on Apple, Spotify, the Bloomberg Business app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby, and we begin today's program with home buyers, home sellers, home builders, and home improvement chains. For more on where we stand, we welcome Bloomberg Intelligence U.S. home building analyst Drew Redding. Drew, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Hey, well, let's start with the biggest roadblocks in the in the home home buying, selling everybody. Sky high home prices, a dearth of homes on the marketplace. And mortgage rates, which just last week rose back above 7% for the first time since early December. Drew, is there any relief in sight? Any good news out of this? I think you hit the nail on the head with the challenges facing the home buyer. I mean, we've had home prices rise more than 40% over the last couple of years. We've had interest rates rise from 3% to now above 7%. And we have the, the worst affordability on record if you look at monthly payments relative to income. Um, we've been describing the housing market as kind of a tale of two markets. On one hand, you have the resale market who's battling not only the high rates, but low inventory and homeowners who don't want to sell. On the other hand, you have the, uh, the new home market where builders have done extremely well. Sales actually grew in 2023, and that's because they've been bringing more supply to the market. They've been pretty aggressive in adjusting base prices. So if you look at prices in the new home market, they were actually down double digits in 2023. And most importantly, they've been offering financing incentives. So that's been a big tool in their belt that the existing home market really doesn't have to leverage. So a buyer who's going out into the market now is looking at something in the 7% range. Builders are able to offer lower rates somewhere in the five and a half to six percent range. So that's a, been a huge differentiator for them. Now you follow the builders, so you know what they do, where they do it, how they think. Home builder sentiment actually was, uh, I think, a six month high right now. However, uh, they also face a lot of challenges, don't they? Uh, not enough available land, not enough uh, skilled labor. I mean, how are they still building these homes where people want to buy? with the challenges that they face. Yeah, builders have been been facing these challenges for quite some time now. You mentioned, you know, the lack of available labor, particularly as volumes heat up, um, the lack of developed land, which we think could become even more of a problem for the industry. Um, but the, the way I would look at the new home market is on one hand, you have the large, well-capitalized, publicly traded home builders. And on the other hand, you have small their smaller private peers. We think that the large builders are going to continue to take market share from those smaller private peers. And the main reason is because a lot of the private builders are reliant on regional bank financing in order to grow, whether it's for land acquisition, land development, or construction loans. And with not only the cost of those loans going higher, but also the availability as the economy has weakened a little bit, we're seeing their ability to access that growth capital has come down. So we think that the the large builders are stepping in to fill the void because they've got strong balance sheets, they've got long land pipelines, and they're able to self-develop their land. So we think that, you know, as we move through 2024 and into 2025, they'll continue to be the beneficiaries. Now, I imagine also some of these builders, the ones benefiting the most are the ones building homes where people want to live. And that means the Sun Belt, Florida, all the way across to Texas and the Southwest. Are there other builders having success? You know, the Toll Brothers up in the Northeast, are, are they building big houses, McMansions or even mansions? Are are they all seeing, you know, does the rising tide lift all boats in the housing market? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And, you know, <clears throat> when you look big picture, the Sun Belt is really where you want to be due to more favorable demographic patterns. That's where the population shifting. That's where the job growth is affordability is better. So you see some migration out of some of the higher cost markets. What's interesting right now is we are seeing a pretty broad based um, 
rebound in the new home market across the country. Um, some of the hardest hit markets in the back half of 2022 were in the West, think California, the Pacific Northwest, the Southwest, but we're even seeing a strong rebound there. Um, you mentioned the Northeast, which is actually an interesting example, because if you look at sales paces that the builders have been doing relative to 2019, the, the Northeast and the Midwest have held up really well. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that maybe these are markets that didn't participate as much on the way up. So they weren't the boom markets, um, but they also didn't fall as much on the way down when when things got a little bit hairy there in the back half of 2022 and into 2023. So the Northeast has done really well. Um, we heard from Toll Brothers recently, they noted strength across their entire footprint, across all of their price points. So it's been a pretty broad-based rally. Wow. Yeah. Well, everybody wins. Now, one <laughs> one thing you have been reporting on, though, is is more modest moderately priced new homes, uh, more of them going up. What can you tell us about that? There's been a decided shift over the last several years um, from builders who wanted to engage more at the entry level. Um, one of the reasons is because that's where a lot of the demographic-based demand is now and will be in the coming years. Uh, the other reason that they're targeting that market is for relative affordability. Um, as I mentioned, affordability is is near the worst on record. So one way builders are looking to address that is through doing um, smaller square footage floor plans, which allows them to get the price down. They're also doing projects with more density so they could spread more units um, over you know, the same piece of land and spread out costs that way and address affordability for the buyer through density. So there's a couple of different ways they're doing it. It's something that's been ongoing for a couple of years, but it's starting to be emphasized a little bit more now. One last question, Drew, and it's about last week we had Home Depot earnings. This week we have Lowe's. Are we likely to see the same kind of, not disappointing results, but uh, clearly home improvement projects have slowed down? Yeah, expectations coming into the the print for Lowe's aren't all that high. Um, As you mentioned, Home Depot gave, gave some rather disappointing guidance, I think, on the outlook for 2024, calling for the market to be down about 1%. I expect to hear similar commentary from Lowe's. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence U.S. home building analyst Drew Redding. And up next, some closely watched economic data points out this week, what they could mean for the Fed's next policy meeting just three weeks from now. And for more, we welcome Bloomberg International Economic and Policy Correspondent Michael McKee. Well, let's start with the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. This is a mouthful. The Personal Consumption Expenditure Core Price Index for the month of January and the fourth quarter. That's the biggie this week. What are you expecting to see? Well, we get the fourth quarter as part of the GDP report, and it's a, a revision. So that doesn't get as much attention from the Fed because it's quarterly. It's over a three-month average. But the uh, monthly number, which represents the, the latest month that we have, will be January. And that's the one that the Fed looks at because it gives them the most complete picture, they think, of where inflation is at the moment. And that's going to be the key for uh, them, where inflation is at the moment in the PCE, because in the CPI, obviously, it was not good news uh, for January. Now, um, the forecast uh, for the PCE is for a 2.4% year-over-year increase, which is uh, down from 26 the year before, and a 2.8% uh, down from 2.9% for the core. Uh, Fed uh, Vice Chair Philip Jefferson spoke uh, last week and said the Fed staff is basically predicting the same thing. So there are people out there who think we might see an increase in the uh, PCE this month because of some unusual factors, but uh, the Fed seems sanguine going into the number. Now, what are the factors that we see that could make inflation even worse? Well, one of the questions is what's happening with energy and with food, because those went up in the uh, CPI report, uh, expected to, but not by as much as they did. And then the ongoing question is always what's happening with uh, housing. The CPI showed uh, unexpected strength in housing inflation when it's supposed to be, according to everybody who follows it, going down. It's less of a weight in the PCE, so it may not make as much of a difference, but uh, it could affect uh, that number as well. But the big one in the PCE, this is what I call the POGO problem. 
we have met the enemy and he is us. Uh, our, our, our listeners are at fault because uh, so much trading has gone on in the markets. Uh, and obviously the markets have continued to go up. So uh, stock trading fees are a big component of why the PCE has stayed high. And there are some analysts who really follow this stuff closely who think that's the number that's going to push PCE higher instead of lower. Let's go back to GDP, because you, you, you talked about that. We're, we're going to get a reading, a second reading on fourth quarter GDP. What kind of growth, overall growth, are we expecting in the economy? And also, what does that mean for the full year? <laughs> oh, if we only knew what it meant for the full year. 3.3% uh, was the initial read, and the economists we surveyed don't expect a change in that, just a little bit of a change in the composition with more coming from uh, business investment and inventories and a little bit less from personal consumption, consumer spending. But uh, for, the, for the year, the view has been that we are seeing a slowing in the economy, and we have seen some numbers that suggest that. But uh, I go back to some of the remarks from Fed officials in this last week where they warn that uh, one of the dangers is that consumer spending doesn't drop off that much and that we do see a stronger than expected economy through the year that could put pressure on inflation and that would have an impact on if and when they start cutting interest rates. So it's something to uh, keep in mind. Uh, it's, it's really hard to make a prediction because it's been so um, – it's been so weird coming out of the pandemic. Uh, nobody expected the kind of recovery that we've gotten, and it could keep going. Well, I, that's for sure. I mean, even with a, a slight pullback in consumer spending, a 3.3% growth in the final three months of the year is pretty strong. Uh, good news in Washington, certainly, for, for this administration as we go into an election year. Yeah, uh, they should be meeting to figure out how they're going to sell all this to the American public, because obviously the political polls don't match uh, what's happening with the economy at this point. Uh, but uh, overall, if the economy doesn't go into recession and inflation does come down, then that could be good news for uh, Joe Biden. Uh, the saying is always, it's the economy, stupid. And people have wondered if that's going to be the case this year, and we'll see. Well, a lot to look forward to. And our thanks to Bloomberg International Economic and Policy Correspondent Michael McKee. Coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, a look ahead to the Mobile World Congress that takes place in Spain this week. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Up later in our program, a look at inflation in New Zealand and the next move from its central bank, as well as earnings from China's biggest tech giant. But first, mobile technology, arguably one of the fastest growing sectors of the 21st century and one investors think has boundless possibilities. In the coming days, everyone who is anyone in the world of connectivity will convene under one roof at the annual Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, trading ideas and discussing the future. But can telecom keep up with multiple high-paced advancements in the world of tech? For more, let's go to London and bring in Bloomberg Daybreak anchor Stephen Carroll. Tom, the market frenzy about tech and artificial intelligence-driven gains seems to have reached fever pitch this earnings season. Telecommunications is one of the many industries that's racing to adapt and harness its advantages. This year's Mobile World Congress in Barcelona will see major tech companies, including the likes of Meta, lining up to showcase their AI products to the sector. A recent survey of more than 400 telecoms industry professionals by AI chip giant NVIDIA underlined this. Over half of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that adopting AI will be a source of competitive advantage. That's a score that's up from just 39% in 2022. NVIDIA themselves are seeing blockbuster growth thanks to the technology and their latest results show no sign of that growth slowing down. The CEO of Futurum, Daniel Newman, and Bob O'Donnell, chief analyst at Technalysis, say the pressure is on for NVIDIA to continue these gains. The only result that was going to be acceptable was not only a beat, but a substantial beat and a, you know, a guidance upbeat because people are beginning to wonder how many consecutive quarters can this company continue to run with triple-digit revenue growth and high triple-digit earnings growth 
but it seems each quarter they continue to surprise. This is a company that continues to execute and completely blow away everybody's most robust forecast. I mean, they raise their own forecast, the street raises the forecast, and they still beat them. It's kind of crazy. And of course, the big question has been, how long can this continue? How long can this go on? The competition has never been more fierce than it is right now for NVIDIA, but they have a huge head start. I do think there is sort of a consensus in the industry to put some competitive pressure back on NVIDIA. They've been innovating at a pace that nobody else has been able to keep up with. Daniel Newman from Futurum and Bob O'Donnell at Tech Analysis there discussing the latest results from NVIDIA with Bloomberg. Well, perhaps some of those future gains could come from AI collaborations with the telecoms industry. Those conversations will be happening at Mobile World Congress in the coming days. Apart from the latest tech, industry players will also be considering the regulatory requirements that are facing some telecoms companies that aren't applicable to their big tech cousins. Telecoms may just be at the beginning of its AI journey, but will it be a dalliance or a long-lasting partnership? Well, I've been discussing all of this with our European telecoms and chips reporter Gillian Deutsch, and I started by asking her how important Mobile World Congress is in setting the agenda for the sector. Yeah, this is really the key um, event for the year. And I think it's going to be fun to kind of see not only just European telcos, which have lots of uh, things that they're pushing, for example, deregulation um, and, and lots of m talks across Europe, but also a lot of different international telcos and, and also major US tech companies coming to all descending on Barcelona to um, kind of really set the, the agenda for telcos and tech for the next year. So AI is one of the key themes at this year's event. Talk us through where telecoms companies are with him implementing that technology and where they found success with it. Yeah, I mean, AI has definitely hit uh, the telco sector, of course, as well. And so I think we're going to be seeing lots of announcements about, you know, different offerings with different U.S. tech giants, for example, and how they're integrating artificial intelligence into their offerings. You know, I mean, I just definitely think a lot of this is hype. I think anyone who follows tech is used to various hype cycles, of course, um, and, and AI is obviously one of the most recent ones. But I do think there's a lot of really interesting um, ways that companies are trying to integrate AI into their offerings, really kind of to, to improve the experience for consumers when it comes to um, customer service, um, also with businesses and really kind of creating, um, you know, more streamlined offerings for their, for their clients. Um, and so I think a lot of this also will be kind of in, um, with kind of key announcements with big tech giants. So we already saw Nokia's stock going up recently when they announced a partnership with NVIDIA. So those kind of big names obviously are really important to show that they are really serious about AI and integrating AI. Um, but I also think we'll see some interesting ones. You know, BT, for example, last year announced pretty massive job cuts, 55,000 people to, until 2030. Um, and that's not entirely, but at least in part because they're integrating AI. So it's kind of helping them to, to trim some of the fat in the company. And so I think that's, we might see some more, more kind of um, uses of AI in that sense. So does it do we have the sense that European companies are sufficiently investing in this given that so many of the big technology advancements are coming from US firms? That is a great question. I mean, telcos are it's funny, they they are really afraid of just becoming, you know, a pipe in the ground, right? And so it's kind of sparked this kind of panic a lot of among a lot of tech telco companies across Europe. And so that has led to this massive push to keep innovating. Um and and there are a lot of questions about whether or not they actually can outcompete um, you know, Silicon Valley giants that have, you know, massive market caps and have all of that talent obviously, you know, really harmonized or, or centralized into one location um, and already in their companies. Um, and a lot of what these telcos are doing is really trying to compete with them. So you're seeing a lot of kind of IT solutions and cloud solutions and um, networks and factories. And, and these are all really things that actually put telcos in direct competition with um, US tech giants. And I think there's a lot of skepticism that they can really outcompete um, tech giants, but that is really a crucial crucial thing for telcos going forward if they really want to make sure they're not just you know, a utility company. So it is a question of, of cooperation as well as some competition in these areas too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we already do see lots of um, telcos and tech giants working together. They have for a long time when it comes to data centers um, and, and other kinds of, of partnerships they've had. Or even, you know, when you open up your, you know, you, you turn on your TV, you probably see YouTube or, or Netflix offerings, right? So um, telcos really do rely on U.S. tech giants as well. It's kind of a frenemy love-hate relationship between the two. And I do think we see that that kind of um, uh, relationship really play out in, in Brussels, where I'm based, um, and cover tech regulation or have covered tech re- regulation. Um, a lot of these telcos argue that they are way more overregulated than um, their often American counterparts and are really pushing for 
telcos to help out with with um, or te- helping tech giants, excuse me, helping telcos with um, these massive, expensive network infrastructure investments. And they say, you know, a lot of these tech giants get to piggyback off of the really expensive and complicated work that they do. Yeah, that's a really interesting conversation that I'm sure we'll be featuring too at, at Mobile World Congress. What you know, the European Commission recently published a white paper on this on on reforms to the market. What were the problems that that white paper identified? I think it was really interesting because telcos for the past at least couple of years um, have really been, like I said, arguing that t- tech companies need to to help foot the bill for infrastructure. And this this argument was dubbed fair share. You know, um, tech companies need to pay their fair share for infrastructure. Um, that specific lobbying effort failed. But what they did do is really put telcos back at the top of regulators' agenda. They are, they've been really overlooked for the past five plus years. Um, so this white paper was really interesting because it actually dives into the issues that telcos have been complaining about for years and acknowledge a lot of the issues that they've been complaining about. You know, it's an incredibly fragmented market with over 50 players in you across the EU, you know, compared to the United States where there are really three, maybe four kind of massive players. Um, they do acknowledge that they're overregulated. Um, there's too much uh, bureaucracy to to get permits, et cetera. Um, but I think when it comes to the actual solutions, I think most of the telcos I talk to feel like the, the paper's kind of lacking. Um, there's some talk about, oh, we should harmonize spectrum policies a bit more across the European Union, and we need to make it easier for companies to achieve scale by, by merging across borders. But Telcos, their main number one ask really has been to merge in market, and there's very little acknowledgement of that. And you know, and even um, when when the commission was unveiling this paper, um, you know, we had Margaret Vestager, the competition chief uh, for the European Commission, saying, you know, in market consolidation is not the answer. So I think that was kind of met with a lot of um, sadness among uh, telcos. Um, but it also will have a new a new commission coming in next year. And so it really is a question of what is that next commission? Who's in charge? What do they think is actually the solution? Do they even, do they take up uh, telcos as a top agenda item? Yeah, so an interesting time for those companies too. I mean, we're also in the midst of earnings season, of course, as well. What sort of financial state are these companies in? Uh, not not a great one. <laughs> and there's obviously a lot of nuance between companies and different markets, but these, more broadly speaking, we definitely see declining revenues for almost all of these telcos year on year. Um, and, and I think there's some really interesting trends that have come out of that. So I think a good one to look at is Vodafone, for example. You know, they're really a key pan-European telco. Um, they're actually exiting a lot of markets. You know, they've sold off um, their operations in Spain to Zagona. They're trying to exit Italy. There's a massive merger in the UK. So, I mean, there's one, but um, this is an example of the kind of massive M&A talks we're seeing across Europe. Um, and, and you know, this is really so that companies can try to achieve that scale that they say is necessary to actually make the kind of big infrastructure investments that they need to remain competitive. Um, so every kind of company is trying to scramble to find solutions in that sense. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of foreign investment, more hedge funds coming in. Um, whenever I talk to telcos and I ask, you know, where do you see this market in five years? Really, no one has a clear picture of what it's going to look like, which um, is kind of frightening, but also quite exciting, I think, for companies. So it'll be very interesting uh, to see where that kind of talk is at um, and, um, ahead of this uh, at the conference. And of course, one of the really big investments these companies have been making has been in 5G networks. Are those investments paying off for these companies or when are they expected to? A great question. I mean, I, I think what the best way to look at it is to start with the telco infrastructure companies. So this is Nokia and Ericsson. Um, they really hold this kind of Nordic duopoly. Um, they're really interesting because they're at the mercy of network operators. And uh, Nokia in their recent earnings was saying, look, you know, these companies have to start investing in 5G if they want to really remain competitive with each other. Um, and they say that these investments will start soon, but they really don't have a great idea of, of when that actually will happen. Um, and I think, you know, we do see inflation decreasing, of course, energy costs are lower than they have been. Um, so I think there's some optimism that maybe this is the year where things start to turn around, but um, it's not a very um, uh, clear picture of when this actually could turn around. I also not mentioned, you know, not just with 5G, which is obviously a massive, um, um, focus for for telcos, but there's also a lot of talk about open RAM, which is basically a technology that allows network operators to kind of pick and choose parts from different suppliers. Um, there's been a lot of talk about open RAM for a long time, it's been pushed by the U.S. government, um, but it never really gained traction until the end of last year when AT and T announced a massive contract with Ericsson to actually start rolling this out in the U.S. We see Deutsche Telekom also in Germany doing this with Nokia, um, and so I think that's also giving companies some hope, and um, that might 
that might also kind of help for for Nokia and Ericsson, and that might um, kind of stimulate more and more network infrastructure investment. Um, so maybe this is the year, but um, and I'll be curious to see if there's actually much optimism in Barcelona about it, but uh, or if this is just you know another year where there's some hope, but never actually any any reality. Thanks to Bloomberg's European Telecoms and Chips reporter Gillian Deutsch there. I'm Stephen Carroll in London. You can catch us every weekday morning here for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London and 1am on Wall Street. Tom? Thank you, Stephen. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, another closely watched central bank rate decision and earnings from a Chinese tech giant. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Tom Busby in New York with your global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. For markets in the Asia-Pacific region, two things stand out in the week ahead. A rate decision from New Zealand Central Bank and an earnings report from online retail giant and search giant Baidu. For more, let's get to Bloomberg's Doug Krisner, co-host of Daybreak Asia. Tom, we begin with Kiwi inflation. We know higher prices have been sticky in several economies, and New Zealand is no exception. The question now is over the response on the part of central bankers. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand will meet in the week ahead. Recently, the swaps market has been pricing in a possible rate hike from the RBNZ in the coming months. How real is that possibility, though? Let's bring in James McIntyre from Bloomberg Economics Asia. He joins us from our studios in Sydney. James, always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to ask you that question. How real is the possibility that the RBNZ raises rates again? Well, great, Lucas. Thank, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And look, I think that um, I think it's not a real possibility, but the threat is there. Uh, the RBNZ have been quite hawkish still, even though they've done a lot and they went earlier than everyone else. And also, even though they are getting things moving in the right direction, whether it's the inflation story within New Zealand, the unemployment rate, labour capacity beginning to ease up, a lot of that is moving in the right direction, but they've stayed tremendously hawkish. There's a few reasons why. But I think that they're more a threat than anything that's likely to become a reality over the next few months. When you look at inflation expectations, though, can you give me a sense of how that measure has been moving? Yeah, well, there is a there's a key measure of inflation expectations, two year ahead uh, expectations from a survey the RBNZ does, and uh, and those expectations actually dropped down uh, to about two and a half percent. Now, one to three percent is the RBNZ's target band, and they want to hit that midpoint of two. Uh, so, two and a half percent for inflation over the next two years is is not quite there yet. But more than a quarter of the uh, participants in that survey saw uh, that that uh, headline inflation measure moving. To or the midpoint uh, of the RBNZ's band by the end of this year. So things are moving in the in the right direction there, but I think that that might not actually necessarily be the thing that the RBNZ's super worried about at this point. I think maybe uh, that market pricing, which before traders had begun to move to price in the chance of another hike, that market pricing had seen those two-year swaps. So if we think about the two-year inflation expectations from economists, two-year swaps out there in markets, those had been beginning to price in more and more uh, of the RBNZ easing. And that's something that we think that they might have wanted to, or that might be beginning to start to try and talk against right now. So from what I've read about the Kiwi inflation, the headline number is is cooling a bit, but there are elements that are proving to be sticky. Where, Where do we find those elements in the economy? Yeah, it's in the non-tradable side of the uh, of the New Zealand inflation um, basket. So we've had the tradable inflation falling, and that's especially things like the energy price uh, decline and the goods price deflation that we've been seeing coming from all uh, all around the world. And those are the things that are the kind of actually not really within the RBNZ's control. Those non-tradable side of things, services inflation in particular, they're proving a little bit stickier. And in the fourth quarter data that we had uh, on uh, back at the end of January on the twenty fourth, they were. They they were quite a bit stronger than expected, and not only uh, by economists, but the RBNZ's own expectations for those. So that's that's a lot of the services side within the economy, rents being a bit of a challenge there, um, and, and some of the other services pricing that uh, some of the domestic labour costs might be a problem for. Now, we think that, the, that things are on track for those to ebb, but however, the RBNZ, uh, this is this dynamic that, we're, that we've got with the hawkishness and th- some of that market pricing, and even uh, one, some of our economists' peers uh, thinking that the 
RBNZ might want to actually do a little bit more to take a little bit of extra insurance. So not quite there yet on the non-tradables front, which is the part that uh, from the domestic side and from the, what the RBNZ can control, uh, where they've probably got their, their maximum point of nervousness. Still. When I think of higher prices in New Zealand, the property market comes to mind. When you look at uh, how home buyers have been behaving in an environment where rates have been elevated, at least on the mortgage side, has there been a shift? Is Are sales contracting a bit? Are, are prices coming down? What's the behavior of the housing market been? Yeah, we've had a bit of a turn in the housing market. So we had been in a decline as as the housing market was responding uh, to to the rate hikes thus far. But as the RBNZ you know has been on that pause, um, we have seen some life come back into the property market. Now part of that has been uh, the very very strong demand for property that we've seen. So like Australia, New Zealand has been recently experiencing a really massive rebound uh, in its migration. We're getting population growth uh, in the high twos, uh, possible getting towards 3%, and that's really uh, showing up across a whole range of parts of the economy. But in the property sector, it's showing up an extra demand for rents, an inflation problem from the RBNZ. And on the price side of the market, we're seeing a little bit of a pickup in activity, a little bit more confidence in some of those prices starting to rise. So that's, that's again, one of the sort of, if you're on the camp of, of cutting rates soon in New Zealand, you'd be looking at, at where the economy is going in terms of activity, consumer spending, the unemployment rate, and where the inflation track is ultimately going. But if you were going to be a little bit hawkish and, and sort of thinking that the RBNZ could hike, that property sector uh, and the little bit of a migration-stirred revival there, along with inflation on the non-tradable side being a little bit too high, they're the kind of factors that, uh, that you're balancing there. I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting conversation around the table at the meeting of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand in the week ahead. James, thank you so much for helping us uh, preview the meeting. James McIntyre from Bloomberg Economics Asia. Up next, we go to Hong Kong. Kong and the other host of Daybreak Asia, Brian Curtis. Doug, we'll be having a chat with Ernie Bot in the coming week as Baidu reports its fourth quarter earnings. The Ernie chatbot has been generating considerable excitement for Baidu as it looks to capitalize on AI. ErnieBot is based on Baidu's internally developed large language model. And like others, it can generate text, images, and videos. Baidu said at the end of December that the chatbot had attracted more than 100 million users. We thought it would be a good time to take a look at how Baidu and other companies in Asia are doing on the generative AI front, where the buzz seems to be a little bit less than what we're hearing in the United States. And joining us now for a look at Baidu is Jiaping Huang, who covers technology companies for Bloomberg News. Jiaping, thanks very much for coming into our studios. So Baidu is competing against Tencent and Alibaba and others to commercialize this. As far as we know, and I know we won't know for sure until we get the earnings in the coming week, but as far as we know, how well is Baidu monetizing AI? Right. Before we get deep into earning, I, w- I would like to uh, know that the fundamental business for Baidu is still its search advertisement. And it's sort of using the advertisement revenue to fund its uh, riskier projects like earning ball. So for the results uh, we will see in the coming week, it's essential to see if its revenue view is picking up again during a very difficult time during uh, China's economy. But back on Ernie, yeah, uh, it's sort of the leader, uh, at least in the Chinese internet sphere, because uh, it's the first to launch the service to the public. And it already started to charge a monthly subscription fee for a premier tier of the Ernie bar, which costs $8 per month. So uh, monetization is kicking off, yes, but we still have to wait and see to see how big of an impact it will have to Baidu's top line. Now, I know that China has enforced a, a law to regulate uh, this area. It's, it's something that China perhaps is in advance uh, over other places like the United States and, and Europe and others. Um, what do we know about um, how, how tough this new law is? Yeah, so what China did is like for every uh, generative AI service to get online for to be used for Chinese users and need to get the pre-approval from China's top uh, internet regulator, uh, the CAC. And back earlier last year, 
the CAC issued its first batch of approvals to Chinese tech giants, including Baidu. So we got like around a dozen like uh, services that was green light by Beijing. And that's also to say, that also means that foreign services uh, like GPT and the ones from Google and Microsoft will likely never be available within China's internet. So we're sort of like seeing yet another episode of the parallel universe of the China internet versus the global internet. And how different is the approach of Chinese um, chatbots compared to those in the West, uh, particularly in light of the overhang of the legislation that's in place? The Chinese bot will like, actually do a lot of censorship to prevent like, some questionable uh, answers from the bots whenever you touch upon politics or human rights, or actually if you're trying to type uh, the name of uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping in many of the Chinese spots, they won't even let you to continue the conversation. Uh, so I think data is one thing. When we talk about whether it's like training data or like the output data, it's sort of filtered and self-censored that could uh, have a negative impact on the, on the effectiveness of the Chinese spots. And we might think that the search leader in China would have uh, almost a, a step ahead or a, a leading start against other companies. But I understand that Chinese companies are kind of well armed with uh, ample capex uh, built into uh, the spending model for this year. Are we expecting to see a lot of money spent on this? Yeah, actually, it's quite funny the the way it's calling China is a war of a hundred models, meaning like whether it's like tech giants or startups, they're they're trying to build their own models instead of applications. Because in the West, uh, GPT is a clear winner, and in China, like not everyone's buying Baidu will be the Chinese version of OpenAI yet. So venture capitalists are trying to fund a lot of like rival models. And for Baidu, uh, Robin Lee is trying to argue, hey, let's stop building models because it's a waste of resources. Let's try build applications on top of Ernie. And if we were to set aside generative intelligence uh, and this push on, on developing a chatbot, uh, how does Baidu's earnings look otherwise? Yeah, uh, uh, that, that goes back to my first point about advertising. Uh, so. Uh, and advertising, as we know, is closely tracked with China's macro economy, which is not in a good shape because it's dealing with a couple of fundamental problems like deflation, youth unemployment, and a shrinking population. Uh, and for Baidu, it, it's the bread and butter of its ad revenue comes from the search revenue. And traditionally, Automobile makers and the travel agencies will be a big spender in search ads. It would be great if the company provide us any breakdown or color about who who's spending more in terms of search ad and who's spending less. So we will get a better idea of where the Chinese economy is going. Jiaping, thanks so much for joining us. Jiaping Huang, who covers technology companies for Bloomberg News. I'm Brian Curtis, along with Doug Krisner. You can catch us every weekday here for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, beginning at 9 a.m. in Hong Kong and 6 p.m. on Wall Street. Tom? Thank you, Brian. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend. Join us again Monday morning at 5 a.m. Wall Street time for the latest on the markets overseas and the news you need to start your day. I'm Tom Busby. Stay with us. Top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.